Okay, our next speaker is Paul Samet again, and he spoke this morning. What um, he spoke this morning on container gardening, and today now he's going to talk about uh, waterwise gardening. So, brief introduction. He is a graduate of the University of Guelph, which is in Ontario, Canada, and Paul is the Nancy Eaton Director of Horticulture, at the Toronto Botanical Gardens. He, uh, he, you know, he is a featured speaker for all of uh, uh, for all over. Ontario, Canada, and I'm sure rest of Canada too. And today he's, and Paul has been awarded the Young Professionals Award by the Perennial Plant Association. In 2010, he was a recipient of an industry service award as well. And now he's going to talk about water-wise gardening, every drop matters. Thank you, Paul. Thank you. Oh, I turned on. Well, good afternoon. Um, thank you very much uh, to, to Laika for being a part of this uh, wonderful conference and being a part of these incredible speakers, as I said this morning. But I'd also like to take a moment to thank uh, all of you who are in attendance. I had the opportunity to speak with a few of you during lunchtime, and I love the questions. I love the, the challenging, and I think uh, challenging one another. I think that's really important, because to me, it's not disagreeing with someone. It's more a matter of trying to learn from each other's experiences. And uh, I say keep that going. I think conversation is key, and it is critical. So this afternoon, I'm going to be speaking to you about water-wise gardening. And water is a very, very precious resource. I come from Canada, the, the land of plenty of water. And there's been all sorts of rumors, all sorts of discussions about moving our water resources. And you know, we see in, in some of our headlines, you, you think the war on oil is a serious uh, issue. Wait till we start fighting about water resources. And uh, it, it, it's quite interesting, um, because water is a sustaining very, very key factor. And, and to me, I think part of the issue is that some people don't realize how wonderful a resource it is because they don't realize how precious it is because they don't often realize how scarce it can be. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, I was born in Malta, where when we take a shower, it's a race. Because despite being a tiny island in the middle, to, middle of the Mediterranean, surrounded by water, we have very little water. So it's, you know, you're very quick. Or when you're washing the dishes, boom, it's done. And drinking water is a precious, precious resource. So again, I, I found it very interesting growing up here in Canada and seeing just this, this almost abuse of water. So I want to talk about water-wise gardening and, and just remind us that every drop really does matter. And I, I was in an interesting discussion with someone, and we were talking about climate change. And, you know, and, the, and, the, and the world is getting warmer, and there's less and less water. If you compare from season to season, and um, I'm a person of science, so I, I see all these headlines, but I want to see the science to prove it. And there's some valid, valid, interesting science that talks about the change that's happening is part of the world cycle, as opposed to because of man. And so that's quite interesting. But what the discussion I had with individuals was, you know, two summers ago, we had one of our hottest, hottest, driest summers. And last summer was a summer of plenty. The mushrooms were happy, and things were fantastic. And I'm so excited that we didn't even have to turn on our irrigation system at the Toronto Botanical Garden till the end of June. And thank goodness, because it was broken, and I didn't have the money to fix it. So, and that, so moving on. So I want you to keep in mind that when I spent these years in the horticultural industry, and I saw at the garden centers where we had all these fountains that were running, and you know, all of these, and we had to keep them topped up, and it's like, keep filling them up twice a day, these little things. I, it, it just it made me feel a little bit uneasy. And while I think things like this are beautiful, and they're aesthetic, and the sound of running water can be very relaxing and very therapeutic, it also, I remind people, and this was a funny story from the garden center years, we had uh, a wall behind our cashiers, and we had all these wall fountains. Didn't know where to put them, so we put them behind the cashiers. You know, all this running water. Like, where the heck are the cashiers? They have to keep running to and from the bathroom, so keep that in mind as well as you're designing. But water does have that therapeutic value. <laughs> Another story, I'm using the voices in my head that I probably shouldn't have told you. But we see things like this, and the art level of it. And I'm just wondering, you know, as water, we know as water gets pushed up into the air, as it gets put into these little droplets, how it can easily evaporate. And I'll, and I'll be careful with what I say, but I, I like to talk to people at irrigation who put in, install irrigation systems that are watering up into the air, covering the leaf surfaces. And then I get down on the ground and think, how much has actually made it down here? Where is that water all going? And the best part I love is it's pouring rain, and I drive through the neighborhoods, and it's still going. You know, it just doesn't make sense to me. We do have the technology to adjust 
to make differences. And this year, I'm glad to say, we're actually putting in, as, as a LEED certified building, we're finally getting the money, I have found enough money to put in sensors because I would run out and shut the irrigation system off sometimes. I want us to remember that as we're talking about water-wise gardening, we just don't want to talk about drought tolerance, we want to talk about opportunity. And when we look at our cities that are so dense, so much concrete, where we can actually begin to capture water. Part of the issues that we have in many locations is the water that comes down starts to run off and we've got all these issues of things like gray water and, and what it's doing to our streams as it runs off all of this asphalt. So the importance of trying to capture that water. And one of the areas to do so are things like green roofs. Many, most people down here on the streets have no clue what's happening above them. But to be able to use these roofs to capture that water and take it one step further, and that is not the topic of today, but to use these roofs as habitat. It's incredible, the creatures that they will support. So, example, gazoom type. Uh, <laughs> so I say things out loud very quickly. I gotta think a bit more. In this case here, you know, sedum roofs and their importance and how we use them. In this case here, this is the Toronto Botanical Garden. We're only four acres. We're tiny, too tiny. We wanna grow. And, um, but this is our LEED certified building and all the architects come and look at it and how wonderful it is. And, and when visitors come, you know, they talk about all the shapes and that, but I remind them the significance of this, not because of the modern design, not because of the fritted glass that's reducing the amount of light going in so that we don't have to, you know, heat as much or cool as much, all of these things that are important. I remember, remind them about the importance of plants. This arbor that's across the front, when it leaves in, cuts out the amount of light. So it makes that glass box not become an oven, a barbecue. But also very important, on the top here, this is 2,300 square feet, and there's a green roof up there that captures a great deal of water. It's a monoculture of four different types of sedum, a bit of a problem right now, but I'm slowly changing that, fighting with my board about that. But that captures a great deal of water, and that is critical to us, because while I can flip the switch and turn to city water, just in case, I love to be able to go into the spring knowing I've captured enough water in our two 60,000 liter cisterns that are beneath the ground that most visitors don't have a clue is there to know that we're going to go in. And two springs ago, I opened that up and I saw the bottom. And that was a panic. That is a scary situation. So, so I, I look at this and I think about water and how we're using it and conserving it. And I remind us the function of public spaces and the value. And we have all sorts of events that we hold. You know, and I look at the value of the garden, what the garden can do, not only maintaining collections of plants, which I, of course, love. That is, that is my drive. But how it supports habitat, but also how it, we can reduce the amount of water that we need so that it's, it is not the drug that we have to depend on. I give you a very quick example, this water channel, which still I don't know why it's there, but it's part of the design. And all the brides take their pictures beside it because there's the running water. So as a non-for-profit, we have to have things that people want to rent, so we charge them for that. I wish I could get a quarter for every public person that takes a picture with this waterfall. I'd be able to buy more red buds. But the point here, when I first arrived, this was filled 18 inches deep with water. It has to be filled with city water because there's a chance someone might reach over and, and drink some of it. And we dump that every week. It gets dumped so we can scrub it. We scrub it by hand. These gardens are maintained by myself, and I've got a head gardener who is an absolute miracle, Sandra Pella. Um, she's just incredible. We do this all by hand. And, it, and you know, Sandra and I would be like, oh, it takes two and a half hours to dump this thing. Time is precious. So we changed the color of it, made it a little bit darker, but we also do not fill it to that 16 to 18 inches deep, we only fill it to about eight inches. And we have noticed we don't need to top it up as much, okay, depending on the event, and it doesn't get any dirtier. So in that whole time, we're literally saving almost 10 inches of water a week. And I've taken it one step further. When it's barbecuing out there, you know what? This waterfall, which is lovely to look at, I shut it off. And people will often say, well, you can't do that. I say, yes, I can, I just flick the switch or I change the timer. Well, why would you do that? Well, there's no big function going on right now, and it helps us to save power. Oh, how much power are you really saving? You know, it's all part of it. It is all part of it. And let us remember, and I apologize, I don't have the numbers for this, that when this water comes up and around, we're increasing the surface area. 
and that water can evaporate quickly. The way you, you think about this, think about a cloth that is soaking with water. Bundle it up versus a cloth that you lie out full flat. Which is going to lose, which is going to dry out quicker? Of course, it's the one that's flat out because of the surface area. The science tells us, friends, the science tells us. I'm not much of a drummer, as you can tell. So, so while we have all the ladies enjoying the garden and doing their thing, we're able to make these changes. And I think we need to be aware of the changes that we can make. Time of plenty. No, it's about being resource responsible. And you notice what Paul Zama did? I put containers in the water. I garden everywhere. Love that. Lesson learned here when doing this. Make sure you've got a lot of bottom weight. Just as the event was about to start, the water got a little too high, and the containers started to move. And one came over. Fortunately, we rescued that. Won't say anything about my pants. So this is the parking lot here. And one of our biggest challenges was, we're on public land, we don't own the land, we actually lease it from the city, is the water that came off of this parking lot just ran down into this ravine. And there were periods where this little creek became this monstrous surge. And we lost bridges would go. Let alone, can you imagine all the sensitive wildlife along those edges? What happened to them? Who, who is their voice? So in this parking lot, what we've done, and we've worked with the city, it is a city's project, is we've created these bioswells, if you will. And that water just filters down through these permeable surfaces here and gets caught there. Unfortunately and sadly, we ran out of the money to be able to take that water and use it for irrigation purposes, but we are reducing the amount of water that's getting down there, which is, which is a, a plus. Similarly, we hear all sorts of things about rain gardens. I'd love to just talk about those, um, but I'm, I'm, I'm just touching on a number of different things as we go. But let us remember what the function of a rain garden, and we see that because, as I said, we rent a good chunk of our building. And when we see that there's rain in the forecast, we are in a panic because the building will often start to flood because the sewers can't keep up with the amount of water coming off of the big roofs that are on the city property that were built, 1940s, etc., that just pour down and on all the asphalt. And we're slightly downhill from there, and it just becomes a river. The river runs, and it comes into us. We've got all sorts of contraptions. You see us all running with hoses, and you know, we pull the water out to the street and do what we can. So we are working on establishing a rain garden. And the function of these, of course, is to capture that water and to hold it and make use of it. Get the right plant material, my friends. It's the right plant in the right place. Some of those things that can capture that water, filter that water, make use of those cycles where we've got heavy water and then reduced water levels. And we can take this a step further instead of in public places, applying them to your own home gardens as well. So we're thinking of things like this. You know, the driveways, the two, three, four car driveways. I'm not sure about your residential areas, but I find driveways are just becoming bigger and bigger and bigger. And they're solid. And watch water as it hits it. And if it's heavy rain, just to the street. Get away from the property. No, we need to think differently. Keep it on the property. And people are saying, what are you crazy, Paul? I don't want my basement to flood. But we can do things to prevent that from happening. And there is a limit to that. There are <laughs> situations that we have seen where, you know, no matter how many rain gardens you've got, how many filtered surf surfaces you've got, you, there is a challenge. But they're doing little simple things like this, like these permeable surfaces. And I test this all the time. I put a little, you know, as, as it's really pouring, I put down my little paper boat, and I watch it. And I see it as it goes along, goes along, goes along, along the asphalt, and then it gets sucked and gets caught in this permeable surface because the water's pu being pulled down. It's not making it to the street. These are opportunities to keep the water on our property. Similarly here, I had an interesting conversation with a landscape designer and say, who was the shoddy landscaper? I mean, were they drunk when they put this depression in? And I said, think about it. You know, this is actually where we capture the water that's falling. And it goes down into here, and our, our cisterns, the 260,000 60, liter cisterns, are actually just over here. You can't see them. No one has a clue that they're there. I'm actually trying to find money to put aside saying we're capturing this water so that they know, as opposed to all the brides just standing there. But anyways, so, so using what we can, when we design landscapes for individuals, the opportunity to use surfaces to slow water down, to keep it on our property. And there's good, strong evidence of the power of trees to grow under these surfaces and capture moisture. In fact, many plants like to grow that way. Let's learn a lesson from alpine plants. 
Do we ever look at where alpines grow and how and often why they do so well? And the power of having a surface, if, and I recommend you do this on a July or August day. Go out when it's barbecuing hot, take a stone and pull it back. Feel the underside. It's quite cool and there's often moisture there. And a lot of alpines actually will root in those zones because that's where their roots can be sustained. Mother Nature knows all this. It's just we're a little bit slow to learn sometimes. So, but using things like this, and then you can create these patterns, and you know, this may not necessarily be the pattern of my choice, but instead of being a solid surface, that water is staying on the property. And get those trees around and those shrubs to drink it up. Because the power of those trees to keep your property cool. I'm a nasty person sometimes, and I like to play with people's minds. So when I often get asked to do a tour for people, and it's a hot barbecuing day, I take them out into the middle of the concrete. And, let, and I stand there, and I keep talking, and you know I can talk, as you may have guessed that already. <laughs> and I wait for just a bead of sweat to break down on them. And I said, let's move this talk elsewhere. And we go over just a few feet away and step underneath the birch trees. And they're like, oh, wow, has the temperature ever changed? Like, what happened? The sun hasn't changed. It's the location. Well, the sun has changed because now you're standing in the shade. And I say, you need to give thanks to this birch tree because it's protecting you and making you feel cooler. Okay? Back to the point. So remember, it's the earth. Our home. I think we're a little bit selfish. It's a home that we share. We are a small part of it, although a very significant driving force. We share this planet. We share this with a lot of different creatures. Okay, So please keep that in mind. It's not just about us. There's a lot of interesting discussion about turf. And I'll be the first person to say, I don't like lawn. Why? Man, I don't have time to maintain it. And I look at the resources that can go into it. But I also remember and recall times of our boys being outside, and that's where they were able to play, getting out there, having a place to fall on the ground. Whereas in a lot of places in Toronto, where even our schoolyards are no longer turf, and they fall on the ground and leave DNA samples, because everything's been concreted over. There are things to remember that you know, all of these blades of grass, these million blades of grass, are, are helping to cool and, and, and change air, and all of these factors too. I'd like to challenge the power of turf versus, versus plant, excuse me, plant material, but that's not the topic for right now. What I remind us, even in these cases, turf, that it's okay if it goes a little bit brown. Brown's a color. It doesn't always have to be kept perfectly clean. Uh, sorry, perfectly green, not clean. Well, clean too, okay? So we don't have to use all that irrigation. And I love to talk to people at golf courses all the time. And for us in Canada, the golf courses seem to be exempt of all of these rules particularly during our water bands. But I remind people that in the case of turf, look for turf selections that are more drought tolerant. There are many that are out there, some that can go uh, brown and then come right back perfectly fine, or take these areas and look at them as opportunities to incorporate things like, I like to incorporate clover into turf areas because A, it helps to keep it green. My parents were fanatical about keeping the lawn green. I couldn't keep up, so I sewed clover in it. You know, and, and it just, it's, an, it's a legume that fixes nitrogen that helps to keep the surface overall green. And those of us that like to attract pollinators, hello, whoops, bring in the clover. When they're in flower, it's a feeding frenzy. Now, we need to be careful, of course, in public spaces because bees, there's still that fear of them. And when clover is in flower, it's an activity. I mean, you don't want to run through barefoot. So what we've done is we've taken areas at the Toronto Botanical Garden and areas that are kind of secluded that have these green patches and they're being over so seeded, excuse me, with clover. And the city doesn't know I'm doing it. Anyways, we keep going. So, so this is our house where in 1985, this is what we had, you know, scalp stones, etc., all this kind of fun stuff, lots and lots of turf. Well, that has changed considerably as our boys got older, a little bit stronger. And my wife and I had a more and more serious addiction to plant material. We looked at the front lawn as possibilities. Because guess what? The back was full. The sides are full. So we dug out all the turf. Um, well, the boys actually helped with that. It was, um, and we paid them. We paid them. Our boys are young entrepreneurs, I will admit. Um, but what was great is none of the turf left the property. Um, because it is a very sandy soil. I can literally dig five feet, and it's no problem. So I was lucky in that I was able to keep it all on the property. So this is what we've gone from 1985 to 2001. And remember I told you I, I garden in every space? I don't leave anything unturned. Look here. <laughs> when I used to be at the garden center, I wanted to have this article about gardening in your cracks and crevices. 
and I wanted to be the cover of our spring flyer, and my boss was like, you know, Paul, no, no, just not going to work. I never won that battle in 20 years. Uh, he just, and we joked about it actually a few years ago. I had dinner with them, and they laughed about, are you still gardening in your cracks and crevices? And I, you sure bet I am. And in this case here, you know, I, 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 people will look at this and say, Paul, I, I kind of know what that is, but I, I'm scared to say. It's plantain. Yes? I would love to do that. Yes. <laughs> There are those who walked by and did this. When are they going to move? That said, we watch now on the streets. Flower buds are getting bigger, OK, more and more. And the greatest reward came to me a number of years ago. My wife and I were um, in the living room, and we saw this white, van, white station wagon, not a white van, drive by and stop in the front of the house, stop for a bit, and then leave. You know, white vans, white things, there's always that fear. And then one time, I was actually outside. And you, I can kind of get lost in there, as you can probably tell. And I saw the white station wagon pull up, and I thought, OK, what are they going to do? Because uh, there were no cars in the driveway, um, and I, I was kind of there by myself. And I, I stood up, startled the poor lady like no tomorrow. But it was a lady. She was actually bringing her mother, who was in a retirement home, in a long care facility. She would bring her, and they would stop there and just take in the garden. Now, unfortunately, they no longer come by, and I asked to get her out of the car, and she said, unfortunately, she couldn't. It was, it was very difficult, and insurance and all that kind of stuff. And, and to know that that was that bit of therapy for them. Now, I see more and more areas that are being dug up, but I also start to see, in some cases, people will say, God help you, you'll never sell that house. No one will ever want it. Bring in the turf. And I see that. I definitely see that. But to me, this is my classroom. This is where I learn. This is where I discover. And I have two incredible neighbors on either side. One has four children, one has three, probably a fourth on the way. Nice big families. We live in a great community. And it is turf from one edge of the driveway to the other edge of the driveway. Are they bad people? No. Their lifestyles are very, very different. And they try and garden, or maybe try and lifestyle to an extent. But it's amazing. We live in Toronto, OK? And we have found fox in our garden. You build it, they will come. Okay. Now I have to. In Overland Park, I found fox out there too, and deer. Yes. But quick question. Yes. Where do those wonderful kids play ball now? Our boys are all grown up. Okay. They no longer live in the house. I've got a son in Ottawa with two two grandkids, and my other son who does not want to garden. Um, I always thought he was actually a vampire because he never came out in the light of day. Uh, lives downtown, okay. and we talk about what's going to happen to the house and. The house <coughs> Uh, the beds gradually got bigger and bigger and bigger. They helped, us, they helped us build this garden to dig it out. And I remind you back to the conversation we were having earlier that you know our son, particularly the one in Ottawa, who he has a little bit of a garden, doesn't want this because it's work to him. Their garden is an edible garden. It's a whole series of containers, etc. But we use this as an opportunity. And I remind people when you do things like this, there are things you need to be very aware of. As I said, three kids on this side, four children who are now young adults on this side. But when you back your car out of the driveway, you need to be very careful. So I remind people the importance of selecting plants. And please, this is very deceiving. There's actually a ditch right here that goes down quite a bit. So I've got some fairly tall plants. I also use the Chelsea chop, which is a topic I'll, I'll show you very quickly, to keep plants slightly down. But this really captures a great deal of water. And this is what you see right here. And so while I talk about you know, gardening to capture, I really want to emphasize the importance of resource responsible gardening. And that is what I think we need to remember. There are things that we can do. Any place we can, I use pea gravel to help so that water isn't running off. I don't need big flagstone. Plus, I, I can't afford it. Um, and I can't move the darn stuff. Also, you know, it can be artful and tasteful. In this case here, this is an old, old uh, tree grate. I love to collect antiques. And it's there, and it just, we've just filled it in with pea gravel. And all the water stays on the property and feeds that liquid amber. And it's just growing. And we keep it all on the property as much as we can. We hear terms out there now, xeriscaping, and thinking about what it refers to and what it means. You know, xeros in Greek means dry, OK? Something to keep in mind. And when we look what our goal when we try and create a xeriscape garden is to create something that's visually attractive, you know, using plants that thrive with less water. <sighs> I don't know about that. To me, it's more the right plant in the right location, resource responsible gardening. I keep going back to that because our, our efforts are also re, uh, a resource. Low water landscaping designed 
uh, low water landscape design and maintenance. Yes, we're getting there. And I do remind you that there is a difference between a zero scape garden. We do very little watering in the front. Um, we do, excuse me, very, very little watering. Uh, there's a lot of natives in, in here, combined with a lot of cultivated plants. Absolutely. There's, you know, there's a difference between what I refer to as zero scaping and zero scaping. Uh, and we still see that out there. There are ways to make sure that we get that water. As I said, we create permeable surfaces, but we've got roofs, we've got sheds. And I'm almost amazed that it's just a light sprinkle, and how the heck did that thing fill up so quickly? Um, there's all sorts of stats out there. Um, I've even read on some of your web pages right here that uh, 4.2 inches of rain per month from April to October. Is that true? I've done my research. I came. I read that on, on a Kansas City web page. Um, and I thought, oh, that's, that's half decent. You actually get more than we do. And did you know that a quarter inch of rainfall is enough to fill up a 55-gallon rain barrel? And if you do the math on that, that's 924 gallons of water. That's a lot of water. Okay? Why are we going to the switch? You know, please keep that in mind. These rain, oops, these yeah. rain barrels right here. You saw him. You saw one of them. These rainbows right here. This is um, our son's home in Ottawa. You know, they're trying. They're, they're doing what they can. As I said, the focus is edibles. I need to remind my uh, daughter that uh, dandelions are also edible. Um, and, and, uh, but it, what's also important here, I remind us that what we're doing is we're also setting an example. And this is my grandson. The picture is out of focus. It's, uh, this is where I learned about photobombing. I did not know that it, it was even a term. That's Quinn, who is now six years old. Um, but really, really important, the lessons that we, we teach them. So now we step into the backyard. And the back garden was designed to be viewed from inside. This is not a design talk, so I'll move on. But what I want to tell you is right plant, right location. This section right here, barbecues. I like to be in the garden bare feet. And on a hot day, you can't stand on some of this flagstone. I use that flagstone to lift because I put a lot of container plants in the ground in the winter. Anyways, but in back through here, it's quite shaded and quite cool. So I grow all the plants. That, might, that can take the heat, that I'm not going to be a slave to them in this area right here. Okay? I, we spoke earlier about container gardens. And every time I do go to water, I feel the pain. I feel the guilt of turning on the hose because I've got a lot of containers. But even where I put my containers allows me to save water because I will group things like my agaves that can take being dry where it's brutally hot. And then some of the other water hogs, if you will, or in a more shaded location. It also saves the resource of grouping the plants that like a lot of moisture together and those that can take being dry together. So you're not running around saying, oh, I got one over here and another one over here. It's all resources, OK? Be conscious of that. And I did kind of hint to the fact earlier with that impromptu presentation that there are tools that are out there that help us save water or keep things more, more wet. I don't think that's necessarily saving water, and I don't always think that's a good thing. I'm going to move on there. So in the case of succulents, I love succulents. And I'm going to tell you something here. I feel guilty about this. This was during the tour, July long weekend for us. Everyone's taking pictures of these. And I thought, oh my god, I hope they don't look too closely. None of these were planted. These are simply root balls, because I have a technique of overwintering succulents. I rip apart planters. And I don't plant them for winter. I just overwinter them, a lot of them bare root in big trays. Topic for another day. But what I do here is they're just on layers of gravel. And if you were listening this morning, you know that there are drainage holes in these. I just used the gravel as filler in these containers here, and they weren't planted. So from the end of May till the start of July, very warm conditions, they were not planted. Mm -hmm. Now, I, sorry? Do you know all the plants you have in your garden? Do I know all of the plants? I sure hope I do, yes. Most of them, I would, yeah, I would say 99.9%, .9%, yes. I have another question, though. What yes. do you do for the uh, uh, wild grasses, like king grass? And You're saying grass. king grass. I mean, that's a common name that I'm not familiar with. Does anyone have a Latin name for it? Yeah. Sorry, crabgrass? Yeah, Bermuda. Okay, I don't have a challenge in that case because I've dug out most of the area where it can grow. Where I do get crabgrass is along the edge by my neighbor's side who has the turf. And there, I just remind them, it's an annual grass. If you're not going to be pulling it, let's not be treating it. Let's just get the seed heads off. And I've watched over a few years, by just preventing crabgrass from going to seed, you're killing the population. Because it's an annual. And the way it perpetuates is by dropping its seed. So don't let it seed. 
and you're cutting on, on the future generations, and the crabgrass is disappearing from that space. So, you're welcome. I want to highlight, highlight just a couple of plants that are water, um, water conservers. In this case here, euphorbia, sticks on fire. Wonderful succulent that just, just is amazing, can take being extremely, extremely dry. And in this case here, from a design standpoint, note how we're echoing and repeating it. You'll see the watering can there. I also fill watering cans and do leave them in locations for those emergency waters. And people say, oh my gosh, you leave standing water. What about the mosquitoes? We never have that problem because we end up using that water quite quickly. And then I go back to the uh, rain barrel. Um, so learn to work with plant material, plant material right place. In this case here, succulents, just we'll talk about them just a little bit, bit longer. I mean, it's a very tempting and addictive group of plants. In the world of Echeveras, I could talk all afternoon about them. I collect Echeveras, there's all different selections, all different forms. But here's a case in point where I want to emphasize, and I kind of hinted about this earlier, you know, in locations where things consume a lot of water, where we are slaves to them, why not take plant material that can take hot, dry locations, and in this case here, use succulents in hanging baskets. Okay? Now, I did not do this. This is not my design. I would have done it very differently, but I thought it was quite creative. Okay? I just would have filled in those gaps. This is a, this is a picture I showed you earlier. Okay? Hot, dry locations and can take the cold. You know, right plant, right location. And I don't have to worry, you know, worry at work. Oh my gosh, are they all going to be okay when I get home? Using our water resources. And when we look at succulents, we are seeing that revival of even some of the most common but well, people say, oh, grandma's plants, house leeks, or hens and chicks. We're seeing that huge revival. And this just group alone, the selections that are in there, the beautiful art forms. I personally think we need to evaluate Sempervivums, the hardy hens and chicks, for their spring color and their fall color. Have you ever stopped and looked at Sempervivums to see them change color through the seasons? Do you know that they change color through the seasons? Most people tell me you've got too much time on your hands if you sit there and watch plants. But it's true, they're quite magical. But I want to show you in this case, being water wise and design conscious. Because some people will say, oh, but if you're doing that, you lose the aesthetic value. No, you don't. It's let's bring them together. Let's learn to combine things. So in this case here, taking things like the um, hens and chicks, see how we've got the spiral form on them? See how it's echoed in the design with the spiral planter, the spiral stone? Look at the surface around it, like radiating like the sun, to capture that water that misses it, that goes down and filters into the ground. This is not in my garden. This is at Sissinghurst in the UK. But I thought it was absolute, absolute brilliance. Okay? Know to find the plant for the right location. If we're talking about being water wise, we don't want to put in plants that consume all our resources. One of the ways that we need to, one of the things that we really need to be aware of is the resource of the ground that we're working with. And personally, having spent a lot of years in the industry, and particularly at the garden center, we spend too much time worrying, feeding, worrying about feeding our plants. If you're growing plants in the ground, you do not feed the plants, my friends. You feed the ground. Get that organic matter in there. It's very, very important. Learn to give back, OK? Learn to make your own free fertilizer. And what does this have to do with conserving water? By adding the organic matter, we actually help to improve water retention okay, for the plants that need it. And that's very important for the plants that need it, as opposed to those that don't. And we've always talked about you know, cultivating. We've learned this. I still have textbooks, double digging, you know, breaking up that surface. But by doing that, you again create surface area, and soils actually dry out quicker. So is that the right thing to be doing? And not to mention what happens to the poor, the poor fungi, bacteria, and all the soil microbes that exist in those layers as you turn them over. You're turning the world upside down. And there's strong evidence to show their populations crashing as a result of cultivation. So be conscious of that. So we add organic matter. And there's opportunities. Yes, definitely work in things like the compost. I don't know if this happens here, but we talk about carbon footprint and moving resources. All those dry leaves, sources of carbon that get taken out to the curb and get trucked away. No, just take the lawnmower out and shred them. In fact, my wife and I have a system to drive up to a driveway. The CRV slows down. I can get out of the CRV, get it into the car barely stops, get those bags into the car, and we're off and going. <laughs> System works perfectly. We've gotten caught a few times. What are you doing? We're taking your leaves. Why are you taking your leaves? Because you've got a beautiful oak tree. How many do you want? I've got neighbors that now bring me bags of leaves. So the, the problem is, sometimes I get up in the morning and think, uh-oh, Uli, I can't get out of the driveway because there's so many leaves down there. 
but it's a powerful thing. And I wish, the only thing I wish is that I didn't have to use the gas lawnmower, which is the only time that I use it in the fall. Yes? When you whip the leaves, you immediately use your blades and mulching and lay them on the ground? What I do is I take them okay. into the backyard on my little piece of lawn. I shred them with the lawnmower. Usually I check to see how moist they are. I like them to be a little bit dry. And then I take them out of there and I rebag them in plastic. Oh, I know. This guy from Canada. And why I do that in the fall is they heat up and they begin to break down. And then I wait as the ground is beginning to freeze and there's some resistance. That's when I spread them. It's one of the greatest joys I have, being out there spreading leaves. My boys say I should get out more, but hey. But I love the power of that because I'm thinking about, I don't feed the garden. Sorry, I don't feed the plants in the garden. I'm feeding the worms. And when I go out in April and I, I go out there on a rainy day, and in the middle of the night, I can hear the symphony of worms. They're not singing, of course, they're rustling through the leaves. And I can put down a two to three inch layer of leaves in the fall, which are gone by the start of June the next year. Do you know how many bags of leaves that means that have not left the property? Plus bringing to us the truck that doesn't have to pick them up. And this, by the way, is Lazula, one of the best perennials for dry shaded locations. This grows in an area where you go to stick the shovel in and it comes back at you. Brutal. Another wonderful plant for dry shaded locations is epimediums. The key, of course, is get them established. I mean, we are cold. We are cold up there in Toronto. Uh, but the key is to get them established. And personally, I love epimediums because of that foliage. Hello. The flowers, yeah, they're pretty. Move on. Look at the foliage. And how once they become established, they don't need much moisture. The other thing that we do need to keep in mind, please, is I'm on till 3 o'clock, right? I have the fear, no, I have the fear, we've got lots of time, but I had the fear of being 11.35. I thought, man, I've gone over. That was this morning's talk, okay. <laughs> Moving on. <laughs> See, that's how I keep time, if you haven't noticed. So the other thing that I remind people is when we are watering, get water where it's needed. Deliver it where it needs to be. This general broadcast, this general throw it out there and pray that it makes it to the location, that's not responsible, okay? It's not right. Now, I, these are not glamour shots, I realize. But the power of a slow drip to really get things to soak as opposed to going out there. And I love it. I take a different route home all the time, particularly in the summer, because I look at people's gardens. I get inspired by people's gardens. And I love all the, we have a lot of what I call garden orchestra conductors in Toronto. And I'm sure it happens here, the people that are out there on their lawn with a gun, and they're watering their lawn, and they're doing this, and all of this kind of stuff. And I feel like stopping and saying, you know, rolling down the window and saying, you know, not a lot of that's getting to the roots. Um, but I don't. It's good therapy for them, I guess, you know, as they do that. Hopefully they change and work the other arm as well. But the importance of, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> the importance of delivering water where it needs to be. You know, these drip irrigation systems, it's water there close to the root system, not having to come out of something and get down there. And I realize that I'm going to upset some irrigation people, and, and I'm not doing it to upset them. I'm doing it so let's talk about it. And our irrigation company is not too happy with me right now because I still want to talk about it. And they say, go away. So but I say, I pay the bill. Um, the other thing we, we see, we've learned, using mulches. Why do we use mulch, mulches? Tell me, tell me, let me hear. Well, absolutely. Whoa, one time. Weed suppression. I heard moist. Absolutely. Regulate. Regulate. Yes. Love it. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen, brother. That is why we use mulches. I see all of these things out there. And yes, weed suppression. Absolutely. They're weaker. Moisture. Absolutely. It relates to today. But to me, the most important, and regulate soil temperature. Uh, but to me, the most important thing for a mulch is one that breaks down and feeds the earth. Feeds, because guess what? Then they have to come back and buy more. We need to keep that economy going. Right? But more importantly, it's adding that organic matter that can help moisture retention. And that's really, really cool. And yeah, I agree, you know, the few weeds that do grow, then they're easier to pull out and it's not so hard on you. I'm telling you, one of the best things I love to do is get one of those weeds that will not come out and I start digging for it. Because you're coming out. It's my therapy. Not everyone's the same. So, but then we see things like this. And I'm all for, I was talking to a supplier, yeah, this is a great new mulch, it's coated, it doesn't break down, lasts 10 years. <laughs> you know, are, are we connecting on the same level? I'm not saying they're a bad person, but are we connecting on the same level? I mean, there's a mulch out there to match any Martha Stewart color right now. You know, and I'm a fan of Martha, I think she's done wonders for the industry. 
You know, it's, it's these, these ideas, and I think, no, let's get it right. And then I see this, this design. Oh, I know, that gasp. Hopefully it's at the picture, not at me. <laughs> but it's this whole thing, and I think, how on earth do you ever, ever restore the organic matter here? Does someone come and pull all those stones off and then put it back on? I highly doubt it. I mean, it would be a great way for some employment, maybe. You know, I, I've got two grandkids that would love to help with that. But having said that, actually, they wouldn't like to do that. One of them doesn't even like to get dirty. I've got to work on that one. Uh, but in this case here, you know, these solutions, they may be aesthetic. What is that doing wrong? Well, to me, it's doing a lot of things wrong. It is a weight. It is compaction. <laughs> It is the, so the pressure. I mean, you know, when you walk on soils, be aware of what you're doing. You're squeezing air pockets out of the soil. It is also not allowing for things like organic matter and at the level that I think they're needed to get back there. And I see all these beautiful trees, and then they've got all these riverbeds around them. Where are they getting their organic matter? I bet you they're trying to grow as, as quickly as they can to get past that layer where they can actually absorb. And I'm just going to start digging on some golf, golf courses, probably get arrested at doing it. So. So again, we go back to this image. I know it's not a sexy image, but right plant, right location. What are you dealing with? Know what you're dealing with. And in a lot of cases, when we talk about water-wise gardening and the right plants for the right location, a lot of plants have evolved for this because of where they grow. A lot of silver foliage plants able to reflect the light. A lot of plants that are pubescent and have the, the hairs on their leaves. It's, it's a matter of surface area and being able to capture moisture. This is one of my all-time favorite pictures. This is a uh, um, verbascum or a mullein. And, and you know, it grows in the most dreadful of soils. A weed to some, bird habitat to others. And I ask how we define plant material and where it's growing. Similarly, good old stackies. I know this is a grandmother's plant, lamb's ear. You know, great for the children, oh, feel how soft it is. But it is a workhorse. And we put in areas where we can't get the water to it. And we've got the cover. Okay, so don't be a snob about some of these plants, you know, and the habitat that they can provide. One of my all-time favorites, and I saw this on the table downstairs, whoever uh, got this plant. This is Salvia Bear Garden, another plant that would go with me to the, uh, to the, uh, the desert island. What I love about this plant is how drought tolerant it is. It grows, remember where I showed you my driveway? It grows right on the edge, surrounded by the street, driveway on one side, and garden on the other. Loves hot, dry conditions, so this is a bit of a misnomer here. This is a bit more of a sexy shot, if you will, with the bird bath. Um, but in this case here, just tr loves dry conditions, looks fantastic in the fall, into the winter, and then come the spring. You do not, do not, do not. I remind you, this falls into the category of a lot of the silver foliage plants, like lavandulas, perovskias, um, and there was another one that I just forgot. Of course I did. Oh, some of the woody artemisias. Do not, do not, do not cut them until they start to show signs of growth. You will kill these plants if you cut them too early. And that is how we lose a lot of perovskias in gardens and lavendulas. People cut them too early. Moving on. You're talking about water-wise. Things like thyme. Woolly thyme. It's amazing. We'll grow in all sorts of conditions, very poor conditions, once it becomes established. And I remind people who are trying to do things, for example, where they do flagstone. And this always amazes me. You know, they create flagstone on top of limestone screening. Yeah. No, we have flagstone in our garden. I just set it right on the ground. Well, then it shifts. Yeah, it does shift sometimes. I can refix that. But by growing it directly on the, by putting the flagstone directly on the ground, I can plant right into that flagstone and squeeze in plants. But I often see people, what they'll do in the case of flagstone, is then they take that little pot, we call them four inch pots, or even a quart, and they're out there with the knife slicing it to try and get it into those cracks and crevices. I remind you, lift a piece of flagstone, grow, let this, plant this plant with a good root ball in that space, let it begin to establish, and it will start to fill in those spaces, as opposed to cutting these little things, which you have to sit there and water and water and water because you've severed them so much. So mean of us. So mean, yes? Uh, the most, most of them, except uh, what I do in my containers, although I grow more and more perennials in containers. Um, but everything in the ground, I would say about 98% of what's in the ground. Maybe 96, but who's counting? So the most, most part is. Because my wife and I are very, very busy. So you see this garden. That's a good question. So, Why did you ask what was on your mind? Oh, I was thinking that I was just trying to make my garden a whole perennial garden. Mm -hmm. My mom could say it can't be done, but I was just like, oh, yeah. Oh! Let me talk to your mother. <laughs> Let me take her out to lunch. 
And but this is this is the opportunity we take to people because I suspect your mother, like our son, says, you know, you become a slave to the garden. No, select the right location. A lot of these plants, you know, and I have issue with this whole nonsense. And any of you that are promoting no maintenance gardening, stop it. No maintenance gardening? Oh my gosh, these plants are alive. Are you no maintenance? I know I certainly ain't, so moving on. But in this case here, I'm even forgetting what my topic is now. But in this case here, we show this example, and I remind you about the resources. So the thyme is very drought tolerant, can grow in pretty brutal conditions, okay? Filling in the cracks and crevices, so making Paul happy, because we're squeezing plants in, and in this case, inviting the pollinators in. And that's one thing I will warn you about things like thyme, when they are in flower, it is a hub of bees. So this is when I don't necessarily walk barefoot in the garden. I'm not too fond of bee stings. So, and our son is actually allergic, so we have to be a little bit careful. But in this case here, that foot traffic. And there's been all sorts of discussion about steppable plants and under a foot. And I know Frances Hopkins quite well. And I remember when she started to introduce the plants. Hey, Frances, let's be nice to our plants. You know, she'd do these demonstrations of jumping on them. And it's like, come on, remember that. So another example, lavender. Personally, I think we lose more lavender in the garden because we plant in soils that are too rich. We water too much. If you ever see where lavender is growing and doing really well, it is brutal conditions. Brutal dry conditions. And if it is too rich, what I find is lavender, lavender grows and begins to crack. It begins to open up. It's just growing too much. Okay? Right plant, right location. Cut back on the water. Skip this plant. Okay? And then the right partners. The ornamental grasses, so key, so important. This is a topic all unto itself, but ornamental grasses, once they become established, what are they tolerant of? Very dry conditions. Now, I realize where I'm speaking, we have issues too. And there's this whole movement of be careful with certain ornamental grasses, some of them being invasive, things like miscanthus, imperata. I tell you, for us, as an example, imperata is not a problem at all because it never has the opportunity to seed. Our season is not long enough. Similarly, a lot of the miscanthus are not a problem for us because our season is not long enough. Um, in fact, I love many miscanthus. But I remind people about the importance of grasses and knowing what the grass is. Okay? I have still gone to the garden centers, and shame on them, and seen Penicetum cetacean rubum with a perennial tag on it. I don't know about in Kansas, but in Toronto it sure isn't a perennial, and I know it ain't a perennial for you here either. Okay? Those are those generic labels that are often made to go all across the U.S. Uh, and, then, and then we're lucky to get the, the leftovers. They come up to Canada, those labels. Uh, I remember talking to John, who produces a lot of the labels, and he was saying, Paul, <laughs> I have to print, I have to make it economical, so they, they get distributed across. Um, so being aware of that. Also, doing your homework. I don't know if you have the experience with Phalaris, ribbon grass. If I was to plant this in this floor, by the time I finish my presentation in 20 minutes, it would be going out the door. Phalaris is a disaster. It is a nightmare. It's actually a lovely grass, but man, it motors. For us in Toronto, it has gotten into our ravines. It is a battle I believe we have lost. It is choking a lot, of, a lot of our natives. It just motors. And sadly, in retail settings, it is still offered for sale. I pulled it many, many years ago, and the designers would come in for it, and it has its place. It really does. Okay, Surrounded by concrete. And it can be a lovely plant. But if people wanted it, I would offer an interview them. And they'd be like, who do you think you are? I want to save you some time. And I want to save that garden as well. So being conscious of it. Speaking of grasses, fescue, some of the most drought tolerant of plants. Have you guys seen fescue beyond blue? Oh, you think fescues are blue? This one is plugged in. It just is a glowing, shimmering, beautiful silver blue. I saw it a few years ago at the Perennial Plant Association. And all you youngsters, if there's an organization to belong to, it has changed my world that perennial plant association, so be conscious of them. But fescue uh, beyond blue, we're just trialing it right now. Stunning, beautiful blue color. I hope it has the drought tolerance of the other. But ask the question, what do I want? Do I want something that's 16 feet tall? This is Miscanthus gigantus. In a single season for us, we'll get 16 to 20 feet tall. It moves, even with our short season. It's a clumper, OK? But after two or three years, if you ever plan on getting it out of the ground, you need a backhoe. It, it's, just, it, it's a bit of a monster. And I edit this plant. Every year, I cut out chunks of it. But I love to use it because it produces bamboo-like stems, which I use to make tomato cages. Topic for another day. I keep saying that. And then in this case here, using things like Calamagrostis. 
Again, beds that are not irrigated. So, keeping in mind, was there a question of Miscanthus? Did I hear a question of Miscanthus? No? Okay. Um, keeping in mind the plant partners, and I know Callum McGraw's uh, Carl Forrester has almost been overused. I, I, I agree, and there are issues of rust. Um, but it really is quite the performer. And when I look at Callum McGraw's, I think of it from a design standpoint, how it gives that element. But I also think of it in terms of the water resources, because it can take very dry conditions. And if we learn to work with plants that like dry conditions, we can maximize. Issue with a lot of grasses in gardens come the spring, they don't look like much. They often look like kind of buns as we cut them down and we wait for something to happen. Don't wait, use that space. And in the case of ornamental grasses, we can bring in spring flowering bulbs and plant them around them because what do spring flowering bulbs, crocus, muscari, tulips, narcissus, what do they want in the summer months? Think about where they come from. They want to be hot and they want to be dry and they want to be underneath the ground. We lose a lot of bulbs in our perennial borders because we irrigate in the summer months and they rot out, okay? So it's really important. Think about where a lot of these come from, places like Turkey, where it is hot barbecuing conditions and they're sitting underneath the ground just waiting. So why not combine that? And in the case of ornamental grasses, which leave a little bit to be admired in the spring, fill out that color around them. And things like crocus, which can take being very, very dry in the summer months, are magnets to things like pollinators, using that spot, okay? Similarly, it's not all the same plant. So, so if we look at uh, Calamagrossus aldorado right here, another beautiful Calamagrossus, not drought tolerant. This one is variegated and often turns an interesting shade of brown in a very hot, dry garden. You learn, you learn. And the lesson here is, you know, just because it's Calamagrostis, is it one that's a drought tolerant? So no. But this one here, woohoo! I love this one. This is Euphorbia polychroma. And a lot, oh yes, who said yes? Love this plant. I love the Euphorbias. They're a very dangerous group of plants, uh, quite addictive um, because of the different selections, etc. But in this case here, what I love about bonfires, I love when it comes into flower, I love the foliage, and I love when Mother Nature you know, waters it. And people say, how did you get that water on yours? Not with the irrigation system, I did it with the um, watering can. Folks, give me just a moment. Is this a demonstration? <laughs> that we all need some water? Yes, absolutely, thank you. Gallardia is another excellent example. If you read in the literature, it says that it's quite drought tolerant. Absolutely. Gallardia often dies out in gardens. Again, it, it tends to be a little bit more short-lived. I would give it that much, so don't expect it absolutely forever. But it tends to die out often because it outgrows, and it grows too quickly, or it is too rich of a garden situation. Likes abuse, likes a little bit of neglect, and it's incredible what a performer it can be. Okay. We come to the native question. And I am a huge fan of native plants. I love them. I think it's really, really important. One of my all-time favorite flowers, Echinacea pallida here. But I see designs. When I was in the garden center, they bring me the designs, and it's a native garden. And there they are. Aquilegia nora barlow. Um, Echinacea purpurea merlot. They're not native at all. Okay? So just, and, and I see this, and I still see this problem continuing. Now, if we look at this as an example, Echinacea pallida, where do you want to grow that plant? Grow it in the most miserable and dry of conditions, and it will reward you. Try and get that into a wonderful, cultivated, beautiful, rich garden. My experience, a year or two, and it says, see you later. It just can't handle it. It's too rich of a situation for it. Right plant, right location, okay? Now, we're, they're very important for, for a food source, for pollinators and birds, et cetera, but please do not confuse them with some of the cultivated selections that are out there. Merlot is an excellent example. It's a great plant, an amazing plant, and it's a plant that adds seasons of interest. And coneflowers, in general, tend to be very drought tolerant, but it's no the right plant for the right location. Another example here, and I was talking to um, two ladies earlier about this, and I think this may be a problem just waiting to happen. And yes, even with what David Suzuki says, and I, I, I'm a huge fan. So in this case here, we're being encouraged to plant butterfly weed. And I'm going to ask you a question. This is a Sleepia tuberosa. Grown it for years. I grow it in my front. Sandy soils. Does beautifully. Loves hot, dry locations. How many of you have seen, with your eyes, not a picture on the internet, how many of you have seen 
butterfly, uh, monarch butterfly larvae on this plant. Okay, 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 right? In all my years, I've only seen it once. So you see them regularly on this, the larvae. Thank you. One year? Only once. Only once. Yeah, thank you. you know, I'm not, I'm not, all I'm saying here is this is a great plant. Very drought tolerant. Yes? There are many different varieties. Amen. Amen. I like you. I really do like you. Absolutely. The, we need to be conscious of what we're selecting and what we're choosing. And while I have only seen it on this once, I see all sorts of pictures on the internet of larvae on it. But in my experience, growing this in many, many areas, I do find the monarchs on it, absolutely, the adults feeding. And I'm not saying don't grow this plant, but is it really a, a larvae host? And some people are saying that they've seen it. So that's good, I'm encouraged, I'm encouraged. I just hope they visit my house. I get the adults all the time. So we need to remember what we can add to the garden. And, and I'm glad we've shifted away from it's just about the butterflies. We've gotten much better, much better at saying we need to have holes in our leaves because you can't have the monarchs without them, their larvae feeding on something. I kid you not, I was at the garden center and I had to take caterpillar monarch butterfly larvae off of a plant because the lady who special ordered them wanted them to plant in her garden but she didn't want the caterpillars. And I thought, is someone testing me here? <laughs> really? She was a wonderful lady. We became the best of friends, and she was mortified at, what, at her request when I said, those are the larvae of monarch butterfly. She was hilarious. She said, you should put me on YouTube. But anyway, so it was just amazing. But you know, sometimes people don't connect some of the obvious things. And am I saying, is she a terrible person? No, it's just one of those connections. But in this case here, so we're being encouraged. And yes, 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 plant. And here is definitely one thing I find monarch larvae on all of the time. Okay, Asclepia syriaca. And you know, a classic example of where horticulture, the environment, agricultural practices, and to show the impact as we create better, more efficient agricultural fields that wipe out and eliminate this plant, and as a result, the poor butterflies have lost their food source and are starving and dying out. But I see a lot of people in Toronto planting this in their gardens, and I say, yay, that's good, but, I mean, this is a monster. It motors. And am I saying, don't plant this? No. But I tell you, we have these in our public gardens, and I have to edit 75% of this every year. Our head gardener cuts it, and then I go out and pull out some more. Aren't I terrible? I have seen lawsuits over this plant. It was in a blue pot, very famous perennial company, got into a little courtyard in Toronto. And two years later, there was nothing left except a few junipers and a sleepia. Okay? And I said, great, you created monarch butterfly habitat. Oh, boy, did that not go over well. Okay? It was, it was a number of years ago. Okay? I agree. We need to be aware. But my point here, my friends, is let's be conscious of what the plant is, where it's going to go. And talk about drought tolerance. Have you seen where this thing grows? I don't even know how it survives in such conditions. But it does. It's a product of the roadside. So, another native that's a magnet and very, very drought tolerant. This is Rutabecca triloba, which gets an impressive five feet tall in our gardens. Love this plant for cut flowers. Love how drought tolerant it is, but mercy. I remember cutting this plant down when I first grew it and carried it to the composter like this, talking to my wife. Next spring, it was a blanket. <laughs> Again, a wonderful wildflower that I include in our garden, but I edit about 75% of it every year. I thin it out. Yes? There is a version of prairie root called a sweetie. I don't know if that's sweetie. Mm -hmm. And that's really worthwhile. Ooh, OK. Really Love it. See how we learn from each other? I, I'm a huge fan of rutabecchias, and this is a new one called Prairie Glow, which I just love the color. And it just had masses of butterflies on it as well. But I do remind us that I, I'm seeing these camps. It's the wildflower purists and the, the horticulturists that call it. No, come on, folks. We're in this industry together. Let's learn from each other. And there are amazing examples. For example, this is another native for, for us, Eryngium uh, yuccifolium. It is an ugly duckling in a pot. It's a disaster. Do not invest in the stalks of this plant. I remember the garden center, we had 20, came in in June. By September, we had 18. I bought the two of them. It looked dreadful in a pot. 
uh, as many unfortunate wildflowers do, they often don't look as finished product as so many of the other plants, which is a whole thing into itself. But talk about drought tolerance. And in this case, combined with another wonderful cultivar of Rutabecchia, Henry Eisler, which I think is a great, great plant. Okay? But there is, there is room for both of them. Let us push and remind people you know, about hardiness. Opuntias, which are hardy to zone two, many of them. We have native opuntias in our prairies. And people look at that and say, how do you bring that in for the winter? I don't. We don't. It's a health hazard to even move these things. But here's a wonderful plant, and I remind them, don't be scared of these big spikes that get into you. Yeah, they hurt, but you can see them and you can pull them out. It's the little tiny ones. Mercy. They get everywhere. So, and then they do flower for you, and they need drier and drier conditions. In fact, when you plant this plant, I remind people, abuse is what it needs. And mound it. Mound the soil up and plant it at the top of the mound so that water tends to run away from it. Otherwise, it's prone to rotting, even if you're not watering it. Abuse. And then it rewards you with this wonderful fruit, okay, which is just magical. Then it turns into raisins, and it's covered by snow. The world of sedums, that amazing group of succulent plants that absorb water in, and hold it in their leaves and release it when they, they don't need it. And the selection that it's out there, ideal for roofs, uh, green roofs, ideal for all sorts of spaces. I show you sedum John Creech, one of my favorites, probably not one of the fanciest of all of them out there. But it does sporadically flower. It's not a heavy bloomer. But remember this picture? You saw it several times today. Here's Sedum John Creech here, growing in this little stairwell here. I do very little to it. It occasionally gets a haircut, depending on the growing season. Very, very low maintenance, but not no maintenance. I acknowledge that. Sedum Dragon's Blood Spurium. This is a curb. I mean, poor thing. Get back in the garden. You're going to get run over, OK? Very, very drought tolerant. And then there's sedum voodoo, which can easily grow from seed. Sedum angelina, with its wonderful color. And it changes, especially in drier soil conditions. It actually brings out better color on this plant. And I think it slows it down. Sedum angelina is a bit of a rabbit in the garden. It tends to multiply. You need to remind it who's in charge or hit it with a shovel. And I love it in, in the winter. Then it gets covered by snow. But if we look at the tall border sedums, you know, the selections, the choices, different colors, different foliage types, all those very drought tolerant once they become established. But I remind you that it's not just about the one plant. So when we're designing a garden, sedum matrona, an excellent example, think about how we can bring out the texture and the form, combining it with, for example, things like Discomptia here, also quite drought tolerant. But as soon as I often mention tall border se sedum, people think of this the cracking that opening, the parting of the seeds, and how they just flop open. I want to show you a technique that I learned about many years ago, and it's outlined in the well-tended perennial garden. Every, every person in horticulture should read this book by Tracy de Sabato Oust. I get no commission from the book. It's an amazing book that teaches you about the care of plants. But what it does is it talks about pinching, the Chelsea chop, taking your plants, particularly summer and late blooming plants, and giving them that chop, removing the, the growing buds, and this is in the case of a sage, not a sedum, but what it does, there's the book there, The Wild Tender Perennial Garden. It is in one of the Bibles you should read. Is that the one you just had on? Yes. Yes, it is. Yes. It's amazing. She's an amazing speaker, by the way. Um, love that book. Uh, but by, by doing that, by cutting these plants back, so here, these have not been cut back. These have been cut back uh, two weeks. And then these 10 days later. So see what we've done is we've staggered the bloom. You also notice that they're not cracking open. So what we can do is if you've got lots of one plant in the garden, you can extend the season of bloom from that. Okay? So keeping that in mind. And this helps to keep them standing upright as well. Okay? Another favorite of mine that loves hot, dry conditions, often called the prairie crocus. This is Pulsatilla vulgaris. You know, we're so worried about deadheading. Look at the beauty that follows. There is beauty in resource responsible maintenance. In the case of some annuals, and I realize, has Verbena banariensis has become a problem for you guys? Has it? No one's? Yes, yes? Have it everywhere. Yes. It is one of those ones that will self seed itself. We need to be a little bit cautious of it. But talk about drought tolerance, talk about a workhorse. Other, other ones. I told you geraniums earlier. Here's a drought tolerant geranium. I use it in containers all the time and it attracts hummingbirds, but it cuts down on the water. 
Spireas. I could not stand spireas working in the garden center after you load a truck with 300 of them. It's like another spirea. Workhorses, very resource responsible. Some of the other shrubs to consider. What about some of our native shrubs? At least our native shrub, the gray dogwood. So underused. Wet soils, dry soils, sun, shade. And it produces these wonderful berries. I love the spikes after it loses its berries. And I love the gray color that it develops. Phenomenal, phenomenal plant. Great for dry conditions. And let us not forget the evergreens. They are not foundation planting. Please do not plant within the 18 inches of your foundation. That is the no plant zone. That is extremely dry. But we look at the evergreens, and I remind people that once evergreens become established, most are extremely drought tolerant. Most can provide a lot of color okay, with the grasses, with things like sedums. Again, get the water to where they need it. Get them established, and they're quite drought tolerant. In this case here, I was called out to this project. The problem with these junipers, very drought tolerant, they were drowning. They were drowning. Do you know what these people paid for this landscape? All these junipers eventually had to come out. So. And then talk about wrong plant in the wrong location, this miscanthus. Do you know they pay someone once a week to come in and cut this miscanthus? So, because it cuts them. It is, I agree with you, absolutely. Find the positive in it, I like that. One to touch on too, yeah. uh, is uh, at the Arboretum, Old Park Arboretum, I, I worry a lot about the bird garden, mm -hmm. and uh, we uh, uh, do get monarchs in it, Yes. but uh, the milkweed is something I'm not sure that we've made use of. In the, there's a huge, for us, there's a huge campaign to, to get it planted. Huge. And what I love about it is, if you look at the people who are asking, it's, and don't take this the wrong way, there are the grandmothers who are asking about it, and then there are the youngsters. It's, it's caught on. It's been in all the newspapers. Everyone's hearing about it. And it's great getting people to want to garden. And I think that this whole push of water resource responsible gardening is going to cause us to see a, re, a resurgence in the, in the popularity of junipers. I know people can't stand them, or they haven't for years, but a lot of the ground cover junipers are extremely drought tolerant and quite beautiful for their color, icy blue, blue rug. So what I want to emphasize here is when we think about global change and, and what is happening and the fluctuations, it's not a matter of it being dry or being wet, my friends. Let us make sure that we're water wise. Let us make sure that we're resource responsible. And as we do that, we will be earth wise. We will be water wise. We will also be time wise, which is very, very key. So, just a reminder that yes, as we're water-wise gardening, that every drop matters. Be sure to deliver it where it's needed. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any questions for Paul? Any questions? Any questions for Paul? One thing we brought up the um, lambs here, mm -hmm. right on the edge of our herb garden. Uh, we, we have some lambs here, yes. and the young people will come by, and I'll tell them what it is, and show them how to have it. Yes. And, oh, that is, wow, this is neat. This is where the lambs here. Absolutely, and they love it. And you get, what I, what I love about it is I saw a little boy who was part of our education program. We have about 7,000 kids that come through. Bring his parents, take them all the way up to the teaching garden. They're like, where is this kid going? Take them to show them the lambs here and get them. This boy brought his parents to engage them. And the other one I do with lambs here is I show them how easy it is to propagate because they can easily make more plants. And look, they've got the power to make more plants. We have the power to show them. Great, great. Any other questions? All right. Oh, sorry, yes. Uh, how many fiber energies did you bring before this? I'm sorry, say that again? How many fiber energies did you bring before this? <laughs> I take none of those things. I, I've, I've got the drug of horticulture inside of me, so. Thank you.